Good afternoon. I hope everyone is doing well, that your week is, is going good so far. Um, please let me know in the comments if anyone needs prayer. I am going to be spending probably the next couple of days uh, catching up on uh, some of these replies and comments and also I've received some emails as well. So just know I haven't forgotten about you. I love you all. I want to make sure that I am, you know, answering you as, as promptly as I can. I'm only one person, um, but I will I will filter through them and I will spend um, as much time as needed to make sure that people get a reply. So today we're going to be talking about wisdom, wisdom. Um, so while I was in Proverbs, uh, this is Proverbs chapter two, verse one. It says wisdom shouts in the street. She cries out in the public square. She calls to the crowds along the main street to those gathered in front of the city gate. How long, you simpletons, will you insist on being simple-minded? How long will you mockers relish your mocking? How long will you fools hate knowledge? So wisdom is being referred to. So we need to know, as wisdom is being referred to as a person a person she cries out she calls so either we need to know who or what is wisdom that's being spoken about here is wisdom the evangelist on the street corner is it the street preacher with the mic and the soapbox walking up and down the city streets no who plants the seed and who waters it is not important God is the one who brings the increase God is the one who makes things grow. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's where wisdom starts. Where those who were once fools become wise. So where does the fear of the Lord come from and how does one attain it? Does the fear of the Lord come from a fire and brimstone sermon at the church? Repent of your wicked ways or perish? Does the fear of the Lord come from the realization that demonic spirits have been influencing you and have now made you their home, their dwelling place? No. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 11 verses 1 to 2 to find out who it is shouting in the streets, calling to the crowds and crying out in the public squares. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. So here we know not only is the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of the living God, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of the God of Israel. Not only does the fear of the Lord come from him, wisdom comes from him. He is the spirit of wisdom. True understanding and counsel comes from him. He is all of these things. Worldly knowledge, worldly wisdom, worldly counsel will only get you so far. So the spirit of the Lord is who is shouting, calling, and crying out of his chosen vessels. And when I say chosen vessels, I mean those who have repented and believed in the gospel. Who have surrendered and submitted to the Father's will and not their own. Luke chapter 21, Jesus said, when foretelling of the wars and persecution to come he said nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom we can see that now a war against good and evil right now is apparent but we already know who wins in the end victory belongs to jesus today tomorrow and forever 
Verse 11 says, there will be great earthquakes and in various places, famines and pestilences. Now, there might be an argument or a debate here. We have always had earthquakes. We've always had floods. Not quite to this extent, we haven't. Not as much as there has been all over the land. More and more and more. Every time we turn around, another flood, another natural disaster. Buildings just falling like a house of cards. And there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. But before all this. So I want to emphasize that. Now it's talking about a time before all this would happen. They will lay their hands on you and persecute you. Delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. Well we know that persecution exists in third world countries. And it's bad. People die every day. Because they refuse to denounce their faith in other countries. They refuse to denounce the name of Jesus Christ in other countries. They are being tortured. They are being raped. They are being starved. And the person responsible will slide a piece of paper across that desk. Or present them with a piece of paper and say just denounce your faith. And all of this suffering will come to an end. And they won't do it. So persecution is coming our way. And it's coming our way in a way that we've never seen. But we've already started to see it creep in. Evangelists are being kicked out of the mall for wearing a Jesus is the only way t-shirts street preachers are being maced in the face they're being arrested they're being attacked by mockers and scoffers while the police sit back and do nothing all for preaching the gospel ask yourself this why is the name of Jesus such a threat that they will do whatever they can to silence you and keep you from talking about him why is the name of Buddha not a threat? Why is the name of Allah not a threat? Or Confucius? Why is it only Jesus? Verse 12. And you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. Why would God allow this? Why would he allow this kind of persecution? Why would he allow us to be arrested and brought before kings and governors? About to be tried for crimes when we haven't committed any crime at all. But they'll invent one. They'll invent one just to keep you silent. Why would he allow this? It's because you never would have had access to those kings and governors unless he brought you before them. And he brings you before them to present them with the free gift of salvation. For it is not his desire for anyone to perish. But for all to come to a place of repentance. A place of humility. Where one can acknowledge that they have sinned against the holy and righteous God and rebelled against his laws. It is at that moment where they realize how much they need God. How much they need a savior. But if they don't, if they don't acknowledge it, if they don't repent, they will have no excuse on judgment day. For everyone will have heard of him from the least to the greatest, according to our worldly measurements. Verse 13 tells us the purpose behind those interactions and divine meetings. This will be your opportunity to bear witness. Who are we bearing witness of? Jesus Christ. How are we bearing witness of Jesus Christ? Because we have the mind of Christ. The spirit of the Lord lives on the inside of us. We are the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth. What are we bearing witness of? The saving grace of God. His tender mercies. His loving kindness. His generosity. The love he has for us. 
and how we were forever changed by it. Verse 13, 14. Settle it therefore in your minds not to meditate beforehand how to answer. Which is what we automatically do, don't we? When we get nervous, rehearse the whole conversation, stand in front of the mirror, thinking on that perfect way to respond depending on what is said, what they might say, what they might do. But we are not depending on our own wisdom here. We are depending on the Lord's and his wisdom supersedes ours by far. So it does us no good to worry and become anxious. God did not give us that spirit. He gave us a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. Anxiety comes from fear of the unknown. Throughout the Bible, we are commanded not to fear. This is referring to an unhealthy fear that causes us to worry, become anxious, restless, that causes us to panic, and run from a perceived threat, which a lot of times is not even a threat. We just perceive that it was. The kinds of emotions, these kinds of emotions show a lack of trust in God. Fear of man is also a snare for any born again believer. That's what the Bible tells us. Fear of man is a snare. Because why? Because it focuses too much on us. And not enough on God. The fear of the Lord, on the other hand, makes us wise. Gives us the ability to make good judgments and sound decisions. Verse 15. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. They won't even be able to have a logical debate or argument with the wisdom of God. What could we possibly say to him? Back to Proverbs 122. How long, you simpletons, will you insist on being simple-minded? I looked up the definition of a simpleton. A simpleton is a person lacking common sense. It refers to a person who lacks the ability to use reasoning and understanding. One who is ignorant, gullible, deficient in judgment, good sense, or intelligence. Simply put, a simpleton is a fool. The question here is what is it going to take for you to admit you are wrong? How long do we have to keep going through this wilderness after wilderness season before you realize my ways are higher than yours and my thoughts than your thoughts? What do I need to do to get you to see the error of your ways? Your part in your own demise. Let's continue. How long will you mockers relish your mocking? What is a mocker? A mocker is a person who mocks, but what does it mean to mock someone? The Greek word for mock is empaizo. It means to ridicule, make fun of, treat with contempt in an insolent or arrogant way, taunt, treat abusively, trick or deceive or to play a game. The Roman soldiers mocked Jesus as they beat him unrecognizable. They continued to mock him on the cross. Another good example of what a mocker looks like is in Nehemiah chapter 4 starting at verse 1. Now when Sanballat heard that we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged, and he jeered at the Jews. And he said in the presence of his brothers and of the army of Samaria, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heap of rubbish and burned ones at that? Really what a mocker is trying to do is to discourage you from the work that needs to be done. But it didn't stop there. Tobiah the Ammonite chimes in, who was standing by, beside him, because we're led by example. And he said, yes, 
what they are building. If a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. So we see here, not only did the mockery begin because they were angry, but keep in mind that jealousy and envy feels just as intense as anger and it's sometimes mistaken for anger. So that also could have been the driving motivation for Sanballat and Tobiah the Ammonite as well. When one mocker sees another one mocking, they usually join together in some sort of a chorus. Mockers are being influenced by a mocking spirit. The mocking spirit frequently accompanies Jezebel. Jezebel hates and has always hated the prophets of God. What they don't realize is that they are not mocking the person that they're responding or replying to at the time. They're mocking God. And God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows that he shall reap. So if the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and those who mock the children of God clearly have no fear of God, and God is not mocked, then we can conclude that those who are doing the mocking are far from wise. Mockers are really just people who have been on the receiving end of the very same ridicule that now pours out of their mouth. So we should pray for them. They need healing. They need deliverance. They need freedom. And whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Second Peter chapter 3 verses 3 to 4 this is the amplified bible first of all know without any doubt that mockers will come in the last days with their mocking following after their own human desires and saying what is the promise of his coming what has become of it for ever since the fathers fell asleep in death all things have continued exactly as they did from the beginning of creation so they come up and they say, nothing has changed. It goes a little something like this. You tell someone Jesus is coming back soon like a thief in the night and to be sober and watchful. And they reply, you've been saying that for 2,000 years. Where is he? Why doesn't he just hurry it up? What's taking so long? I would believe in God if he would just show himself. But we're saved by grace through faith, not proof. You really believe that lie? These are the things they say. But here's what the Bible says. And God is not a man that he should lie. There is no deception in him. No deceit whatsoever. Second Peter chapter 3 verses 8 to 10. Nevertheless, do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years. And a thousand years is like one day. Why is that? Because God is outside of time. Our timing doesn't even apply to God. The Lord does not delay as though he were unable to act and is slow about his, is not slow about his promise as some count slowness, but is extraordinarily patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. So while we're saying things like, what's taking him so long? Why doesn't he show his face already? If he was going to show up, he would have already been here. He's actually giving you time to repent. He actually loves you that much. That he's being gracious with you. And he's being extraordinarily patient with you. To give you time to humble yourself. And turn from your wicked ways. And live in eternity with him. That's why Jesus said to his disciples, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. He wants you with him. But the only way you're going with him is through Jesus Christ. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief and then the heavens will vanish with a mighty and thunderous roar. And the material elements will be destroyed with intense heat. And the earth and the works that are on it will be burned up. So my question to you is, are you ready for his coming? 
Are you clothed in his righteousness, the righteousness of God, or are you counting on your own righteousness to save you? Will you hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant, or depart from me, you worker of iniquity and lawlessness, for I never knew you? Are you seeking your own glory or are you seeking his? Are you walking in the Father's will or your own? Have you confessed with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and really truly believed in your heart that God raised him from the dead? Because even the demons believe and tremble. But if you truly believe what you're confessing, you shall be saved. Are you still friends with the things of this world? Because friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God. Are you practicing lawlessness or righteousness? Do you know Jesus Christ personally? Does he know you? Have you witnessed the power of God in your own life? And I'm not talking about miracles, signs, and wonders. Those are great. But do you have the mind of Christ? Are his desires becoming your own? Has he given you a new heart? Is your heart softening towards the people around you? Are you constantly and consistently losing interest in the things of this world? Are you conforming to the image of God or to the world's? What will you profit if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? The pleasures of this life are fleeting and temporary, but in his pleasant in his presence in the presence of God are pleasures forevermore true joy true peace hope freedom strength comfort counsel healing I'm going to end here John 1 29 the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said behold meaning look the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world.